Hello and welcome to the Spatial Structures Movers and Shakers interview series as we look ahead to the ISS Annual Symposium and Spatial Structures Conference organised by the University of Surrey and taking place virtually in August 2021. My name is Mark Richardson and today I'm joined by Mike Cook who is a recently retired director at Burrell Happold Engineering and is now acting in the position of consultant at the firm. Since 2007, Mike has been adjunct professor of creative design at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College. In 2020, Mike was named the Institution of Structural Engineers Gold Medalist. Mike is particularly interested in the provision of education for future engineers and chairs the RN Education for Engineers group. Mike, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. Pleasure. Thanks. Nice to see you. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you on the Movers and Shakers interview series. Um, Mike, we start all of our interviews by asking about the period of lockdown. Um, you're, like myself, based in the UK. How, how has it been for you? Yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky, really. Uh, it's, there's been, you know, no illness in, in any of my family or friends. So, um, you know, really been spared any of that tragedy. Um, and I've actually found the joy of not having to commute <laughs> pretty, pretty great. And, and the ability to connect into big groups of people by Zoom and Teams is fantastic. My teaching, my students seem to be producing better work than I've ever seen. <laughs> so uh, I'm afraid I've probably um, not had too bad a time to be. Yeah, well, no, I mean, certainly some of our guests have, have observed positives and it's always good to look at the positives in, in what's yeah, been a yeah. challenging. I'm situation. looking forward to a, a bit more of a social life and getting out there, getting back up to London, um, which I quite enjoy. I quite enjoy a bit of city life. So, Absolutely, uh, that makes two yeah. of us. <laughs> yeah. um, so as mentioned, you work for the global organisation Buru Hapold. And um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about this organisation. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an insight to it when I show you a few slides, I must admit, but but it's um, been around since 1976. Uh, it's it, uh, formed out of Ove Arup uh, and um, started out as a as a small gang of structural engineers, really. It's grown into a uh, and we set up in Bath, uh, a nice little little building in Bath uh, and had a, a strong link to Bath University, which includes Chris Williams, of course, who you, who you know. Um, but it grew a number of UK offices, a number of international offices, and we now have something around 20 international offices, I employ something like 1800 people. Uh, and we are engineers in pretty much in all sorts, sorts of building engineering, and also civil engineering and planning and finance. So we are consultants at quite a broad spectrum. Uh, uh, very, it's become a really exciting place to be, to be honest. And, I was fortunate enough to start there at the beginning and and grow with it, and 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 my so my career is is entirely nailed to the development of of Bureau of Apple to the practice. So if it hadn't grown like that, I wouldn't have had such an interesting career. <laughs> Brilliant! Thanks, <laughs> Over. It sounds like um, a very exciting uh, engineering journey you've been on there. Uh, wonderful stuff. Um, Mike, we're going to move on to the main section of our interview, which is entitled Your Space, Your Structure. So at this point, I hand over the presentation to Mike, who will be presenting uh, for a period of time on a topic of personal interest to him. So over to you, Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll share screen and um, get going on some slides. Hopefully, if, if that's all clear. Um, this is a, an introductory slide. I like to just remind myself of kind of as potted histories of some of the projects I've worked on, it gives a bit of a flavour of, of where I sit in the space structure spectrum. Um, I'm, I've not really gone into the theories of, of space structures so much as the practice of, of space, space structures, both compression shells and tension membranes and cable nets. Um, been interspersed through my through my career, which I thought I'd just take you through actually, because my comments on on space structures are probably more in the in the doing um, rather than the the theorizing of them. I'm I'm a great lover of them for their beauty and for their economy, and it's been an important part of my my engineering career, to be honest. So on this starting slide, you see a few pictures, some of 
buildings you may be familiar with, many not, um, and uh, uh, some of my allegiances there, which you've already heard about. Um, so just quickly skirting through some slides, uh, the, the, the start of Bureau Happold came really with the coming together of, of, of Ted Happold and Fry Otto. I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with both names, and that was a kind of coming together of different ways of thinking, of, of engineering, uh, of, of architecture, and, and of a kind of creativity that comes out of this art, science, and nature. And nature was an important part of that. Um, so I started with Ovarup in, in, in 1974 or so, and immediately discovered a group of people who were doing things differently. I didn't know that this was effectively space structures, but thin shells, timber lattice shell at uh, Mannheim. And I was playing around with inverted models um, and trying to work out whether the, whether the building would buckle or not, just with physical models. So I was introduced into the world of structural engineering through through space structures. Um, the, the, the projects uh, that we were doing, we had an, an office in, in Gay Street in Bath, that was all Bureau Happold was, but Ted Happold was professor up at, the, up at the university. And I did a bit, I had a foot in both camps really. I was doing research, I was doing practice uh, up there. I put teaching, but that comes a bit later. And that led, led to just a whole series of what were effectively space, space structures, Com compression shells, this one in, in Riyadh, which didn't get built, um, membrane uh, structures like this one, which was built in Battersea Park, which did get built, and I'd say tension skins. And so I was learned in this physical model that, that I, was, I was building and uh, making models, mostly we were understanding how these, these structures, whether they were shells or, or membranes, how they worked. It was usually about making physical models to understand. And, and learning about how nature was, was creating forms and how it was using minimal material became an important part. Uh, and this idea of how nature optimizes form to survive based on the materials that it's got available, the reuse of, of those materials, the ability to repair um, those materials and so on. Uh, and, and just a, a scan through that some of these, so as you're probably aware with, with Fry Otto, a lot of uh, membrane structures, ten, tension, tension structures, cable nets, and so on using initially soap film models. I, I was very much about rigidizing those models so I could put them in a wind tunnel, better understand the complex uh, uh, wind loadings so we could do uh, stress calcs, um, often just hand calcs, but sometimes as computers were coming a bit more uh, available, uh, a bit of computer analysis, um, sometimes that had to be done by specialists like Mike Barnes at City University. And um, things like the Munich Aviary, Remember, it's really important to do models using similar shearing materials, this woven, woven net, so that we were comf could be confident about the, uh, the final outcome here in, in Munich. Um, I was really the, the young student in, 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 the, in the research lab up, up at Bath University, pushing and pulling and hurting himself on the models. Um, until I got sent away to uh, another, effectively, I would say, a space structure, which is quite an unusual one, the Hong Kong Cultural Centre, where you get um, a cable net, which we had to put this, this, this massive cable net up between, the, um, between big ring beams um, and then hang formwork on those, on those cables and then pour concrete into that formwork with all the, the movements and, and so on, risk, risk of movements that, that were, were to be, and also the temperature changes um, shrinking and lots of, lots of uh, interesting challenges uh, to get that put up. But I wasn't the designer, but I was out there on site learning or teaching people how to put it up and learning in the process, of course. And that was the real break, I suppose, where I felt by the time then I'd done that at about, about age 30, uh, when I came back to the office, I felt much more liberated and able to launch on my own a bit more um, with a, without needing quite so much guidance. That's, um, this is a, an interesting project that's still there in London in Store Street, um, a, a headquarters building with a, a rather weird roof. It, I felt this was quite important because it was the first time we'd done something as weird as this and as unusual because membrane structures still were, uh, and yet it was in the heart of London. So it got a lot of notice. And then 2020, everybody got very um, busy on a lot of things. Bureau Hapwood was, was designing the Millennium Dome, which I didn't, um, but I did some of the stuff inside. So here's a shell structure for you. Underneath this, is, it's, it's shell-like, it's using the curves to, uh, to become quite efficient in the, in the structure. 
but of course this this is kind of it's a building but it's in the shape of a, of a, a sculptured body form um, while while Vera Hufford was doing the dome I was actually doing Excel the the rectangle on the other side of the river from the from the circle um, again it's a sort of space structure I was always looking for even though um, these things were sometimes quite you know flat and and they had a quite a functional you know need need to be simple and flat and you could hang hang you know, movable partitions from the roof and so on they needed to be horizontal um because i was really so keen to minimize use of material that's what i've been brought up on with with fry Otto and so on even if i had to do a flat roof i was looking at ways of making it um, really super efficient and a little bit dramatic you know something to look at uh, rather than utilitarian i wouldn't say this is the most beautiful of buildings but it's got something about it slightly one step better than a shed and was potentially really really light so at about the same time because this was a tw a, a, a year 2000 project um, I uh, started to get involved with, with Norman Foster uh, on projects, which after this one did quite a number with Norman Foster, uh, the architects. And this, uh, I guess you know the story of this through Chris Williams to, to, to a significantly degree, but Bureau Happel were the engineers and, and I was, was leading the team doing the scheme design uh, and getting the competition through the door. Um, and eventually we came up with the need in order to make this really light, uh, we had to give it some quite sculpted form so that we could maximize its shell action. Uh, this is where Chris Williams was absolutely essential to us uh, because we didn't have any of the skills necessary to find the form and to confidently uh, tell us that it was going to work. Um, but uh, we worked very closely together and, and with Norman Foster to produce this very elegant shell. And this was the, the first time, I think this really was the coming of age um, from my point of view of, of my, my time doing, doing space, space structures. And of course, there's a, it's a whole lecture in, in itself I could give. But one of the projects that developed on from that, again with Foster and Partners, was, was another museum in, in Washington, DC, where you can see the roof still has this very billowing undulating form which gives it uh, fantastic efficiency it acts quite as a quasi shell um, but it's got a lot of depth to the roof which we um, needed because there was uh, you know significant bending in this one it wasn't a, it wasn't as um, as, as efficient as, as, as at the British Museum but we used the depth uh, to full advantage um, by um, using it as a, a louvering, uh, you know, a, a creator of shade and a creator of rather interesting patterns. And also it had a load of um, acoustic absorption in the side. So the acoustics in the space is fantastic. They can have concerts there. Um, so I won't dwell on any of these, but then another shell shortly after that was, was uh, the Sage at Gateshead where um, no money in this case, none of the luxury of the museum money um, but trying to get some sort of beautiful form over three concert halls on the edge of the water. Uh, we came up with this undulating uh, series of shells, vaults, but we had a way of, of creating it. I haven't given you the images here, but, but a very, very simple valley, uh, valley um, beams and then bent uh, equal radius uh, uh, joining beams across to make the to make the roof. So it was made out of unbelievably simple components. We just called it a kind of curved shed, uh, and that's been very important to find economic ways. In some cases, this is another one, economic. Um, this uh, yes, it is without having the the sheer capacity. Of course, you have to. Uh, you haven't got um, diagonals in there like at the British Museum. You do. You do. You know, have to work harder to 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 make the thing um, a shell act as a shell. Uh, then membrane structures were less common, um, but uh, a couple here I can show you. This was a, a reskin of, of, a, of a major railway station in uh, Dresden. Um, and Foster's came up with the idea of, could we possibly take off all the old roof and put a membrane roof on it? So we had to come up with, with some ways of doing that in spite of all the horizontal forces, which the arches were never expecting to have to carry. But we managed to do it. And, and it, I'm really delighted with, how it, it, it allowed us to preserve all that steelwork, which might otherwise have had to have been thrown away because there was no way it was, it was good enough to carry the weight of the, of the heavy roof design any longer. Uh, but by putting on a very lightweight design, um, they managed to preserve all of the existing steelwork. Um, and this one, I think it's the final project I'm showing you is, is a giant uh, cable net in, in Kazakhstan 
And you can see the little people um, hovering around on the, on the cable net here, just to see how big it is. And then below it, a massive uh, further layers and layers of parking and, and, and retail and pleasure, as you can see on the internal shot. Um, so this is a, a very simple, and it was the idea was was what would be the you know the simplest way of of, of covering a very very large area. And, and initially, in the early ideas, we thought this 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 cable net would have to go all the way down to the ground. We we eventually realised we didn't have to do that. But it's still giant giant radial radial tent. Um, again, as a whole lecture in itself to try and talk about it. Um, but what I what I like is this shot. Very rarely uh, do you get, you know, as does a designer get photographed, and and it's nice to be able to point it out because what I think it is interesting um, is with all of these these structures, these pretty complex geometry structures, pretty unusual structures, where you're asking a client and and sometimes the architect to come on this journey with you that you really think this is this is going to be the way to go. They they have confidence that you you might be right, but you've really got to work to, to take everybody with you. So I'm a great believer in this communication and, and you can't, you can't, um, you, you have to simplify the message. And one of the best ways I've found is of these very, very simple models that people, people physical models that people can push and pull. And, 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 and you can see that right back in the seventies, that's how I, I learned to, understand and to communicate these buildings. So I was still using that technique right through to the end. Um, and the other thing, as well as the physical models, because you have to take a, take a little time to make the physical models, what you can do instantly in a meeting, and here we are a meeting, me, the, the architect in the middle there and the client on the, on the right, um, is, is sketching, doodling and sketching, and having, in this case, you can see it here, a common sketch, we're, we're doodling on the same, uh, piece of paper. Just again, total luck that somebody happened to be photographing this so I can show you it in action. And we're here we are designing a roof and it's a what I now call here co-creation. Um, and the best way of, of winning your argument and con convincing people to go in, in the direction that you're convinced of um, is to let them join in and to fight. And I think the best way is to have them join in with, with sketching uh, that's done in a conversation. Um, and I just thought I'd show, so here are some of my doodles from uh, the Smithsonian project, uh, just taking people with me on this idea of why don't we try and do it three volts? We can really make it um, efficient and act as a shell, that sort of thing, because up to then we've gone flat. Um, how do we design this, this detail here where the column hits, hits the roof? Um, and how do we make it look really elegant? And you can see the roof gets thicker as it pulls its forces towards the, the piercing column. We had no choice but to have columns in this. Um, so how, uh, because because the the uh, surrounding walls were completely un, un, unable to support the, any additional weight from from the roof. There were really effectively no foundations to, that we could prove, um, and so we had to have these these eight columns. So I, it was really important for me to have the roof relate to those eight columns, um, and then when those columns hit the roof, that the roof acknowledged the fact. Uh, very, very graphically. And that's that's why I think if I just pop back a slide, you can see the vaulting is this three domes, a larger dome in the middle and two side domes, which relates to each of those, those eight columns, the positions of those eight columns. The positions of the columns were actually given to us by the, by the client. They'd already put some piles in before they um, awarded us the job. Um, and here's some sketches and some of those models for the Khan Shatir. A lot of this was done on sort of back of aeroplanes, you know, com com communicating with the architect and then going talking to the client and, and giving them the confidence that this was the way to go. And so that um, idea, I, I wanted to bring that out because this isn't exactly about, about, about um, you know, surface structures, but, um, but it's about if you want to do something unusual uh, that's outside the mainstream, yeah, communicating why and communicating where, you know, what it's going to be like, what it's, how it's going to be built and doing it in a way that other people can join in. I find this sketching really valuable. And this is um, these are doodles, which are just um, other sorts of things. They're about organizations and teams and, and so on. And I find all of that really valuable, which is which is why um, fortunately somebody came along and said, hey, that's interesting. Let's make a book. And so this book is coming out fairly soon. 
Um, there's there's a, a, probably digitally, but um, I'd wanted to share with people this, encourage people, especially young people, to, to get the pencil and paper out and share your ideas to, with others. Of course, I can't be completely ignorant of, of the power of, of the digital, and, and although I'm not a digital, really a digitarati i've been surrounded by fantastic people who are and so the together with me and my doodles and my models i can say hey can you prove that this works um and can you make it buildable you know can you uh get enough data so that we can send that off to the manufacturers and, and, and get it made satisfactory so it's, it's obviously crucial and it's been an amazing boon to what we've been able to do um in 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 shell structures and membrane structures and buildings like this which is, isn't one of mine but one of my colleagues Wolf Mangelsdorf and uh, allowed us to go right down into the nitty-gritty of every single different structural connection these are huge as you can see from the floor to floor scale that's huge connectors that somebody had to model every single one of them and, and, and we did that so the, the digital world I think has ena enables us to to, to stretch stretch the ideas much 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 further but i'm i'm always wanting us to ask what, why are we doing it which i'll come on to so the digital transformation of 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 the engineer's life over the last 20 years has has allowed us to do more complex things has allowed us to understand the complexities of the internal environment it's allowed us to share this, these processes with other people so that they get to understand what we're saying why we're saying it they can even play with play with the models and poke, poke and prod, as you know. So that communication is, is perhaps the thing that excites me the most um, about it and able to bring other people into, into our designs. This is the simplest possible uh, model, but that talks about people-centered design. Being able to show people how um, their space that we're designing for them will 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 respond and how people will respond to that space so i got really interested in that as well so the digital world to me started to be more than analyzing stresses and strains and deflections um, and even buildability and starting to be able to get right down into how do people react to these buildings and, and how does it affect their lives and, and for me i mean here's a couple of biohapel buildings there's the high line in in new york and there's the wadi hanifa revival in the center of riyadh where really good engineering, really purposeful engineering, um, has such an impact on people's lives. And that's the thing that ultimately I'm really interested in. And it, now that we're in a climate emergency, which has become my major, my major focus, it's a, something that construction uh, materials uh, and, and the creation of buildings as a structural engineer that I really have been involved with. And to hear that we're responsible for 11% of global um, it, uh, car carbon emissions um, is, is of great concern. So I spent a lot of time with the institution and so on, uh, trying to make sure we put out enough information so that engineers can decarbonize their designs. But the problem, if you, if you get this graph, over time, we can decarbonize over time. We can certainly decarbonize to a degree by better, more efficient engineering and specification of metal materials. We can work closely with the architect. We can work closely with the client to minimize the amount of carbon, the amount of material that we need. Uh, we can produce shell roofs, which are more efficient than flat roofs. But um, there's a whole chunk of carbon that is very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, so we can do all of these things, personal footprint, uh, carbon in our designs we can even build less new buildings and start reusing buildings but beyond that we've got to start finding ways of making buildings that are regenerative which actually take in carbon rather than give it out in the in the building of them and ultimately change change the paradigm so the last few slides which is kind of where if you like if you want if you ask me what am i doing now it's not designing shell structures it's not designing uh, fabric structures I've, I've got to admit i've kind of done that for a few decades um I'm now seeing what we can do to help shift the construction industry, uh, working with, with the Institution of Structural Engineers, with the Royal Academy of Engineers and a lot of other firms um, to find new ways forward. The regenerative design is, is this moving from negative environmental impacts to positive ones. And if you look up Living Building Challenge, you'll find a lot of very good stuff. I can't, haven't got time to give you a lecture on that, but new ways of, of designing which um, if you look at this is, oops, sorry, this is a building um, of our New York office in, um, in Singapore, 
uh, and uh, space structure, beautiful, with this waterfall coming through from, from the top of the roof. Uh, but what we've got to be doing in regenerative design is buildings that are as, as sparing as possible with, uh, with materials uh, designed for disassembly. Ideally, they're carbon negative, um, uh, I, I, they take in carbon, which is you know, quite a skill, but a lot of, a lot of natural materials and, and, um, and um, uh, growth like, like in this building uh, helps. Um, buildings that actually inspire people, and add to their health, sort of give something back. Uh, integrate into the community and feed into the ecology. This is quite a series of, of ideas around regenerative design, which um, I kind of think if we just think of engineers and the kind of numbers and the science and the architects and the which is more about how people use the building and what's its purpose, we need this kind of we need to come together in the middle and be much more much more you know interested in the purpose and the impact on people even as engineers, architects need to be much more interested in, in the whole thing, what materials we're using, what energy is it generating. When we start to generate these, these people that are a spectrum of people. And that's really where my education bit comes in. We're, I've been very lucky to work with some fantastic students every year at Imperial College. I get them for first and second years. And I, I talk about restoring the equilibrium. I get them to define their own briefs um, to bring in change in, in cities, in people's lives, working out what the engineering interventions are to, to create the changes that they're looking for. So my, my time now is, is really, I'm really interested in how much we can shift, um, shift the paradigm um, so that we educate differently and what engineers aspire to do is different. Um, and here was my penultimate, penultimate slide is to recommend that anyone who's vaguely interested in all of this and interested in how deep we have to make these changes is to look at Donut Economics by Kate Raworth, uh, which I won't dwell on. But my final slide is really to, to remind myself. So it sort of started working with Fry Otto and Ted Happold and um, how, you know, learning from nature, how we can use minimal materials, how we can reuse the buildings that, that we've already built and so on. Um, and it takes you right back to, to nature. So I think I, I love I love being able to look back at nature and, and, and how they, are, you know, various species are surviving, are creating uh, habitats. They're having to adapt to changes in the habitat, but they're always doing it with unbelievable um, efficiency and intelligence. Um, so there's never been more important for us to, for us to do the same because we're all sharing the same planet. We've got to be thinking about about it almost in, in thinking about nature at the same time as, as we create uh, the built environment that is essential for us to survive. So I think that's my last slide for you. So thank you for listening. Mike, thanks very much for taking us through your presentation there. A wonderful number of diverse examples of projects you've been involved in in your career. And also wonderful to hear a few of the names who've been involved in the Spatial Structures Movers and Shakers series. Uh, good to see Chris Williams being uh, uh, mentioned again, um, clearly someone who's been very involved in the Spatial Structures community. Uh, so thank you very much, really enjoyed uh, your presentation. We're now gonna move to the final section of our interview, which looks to the future of spatial structures, and in particular to the 2021 conference um, and its idea of inspiring the next generation, which is the theme of the conference. Um, with that in mind, Mike, what advice would you offer to aspiring engineers looking to enter the field of spatial structures? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I, 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 I sort of came upon spatial structures um, unwittingly in a way. I, I was drawn in by Fry Otto um, and working in Bureau Happold, as you can see, but, but immediately was hooked. And, and I was hooked, I think, because they can be very beautiful and because there's a wonderful engineering logic to them, uh, which leads to low, can lead, should lead, I would say, to low material use. Um, but it has a purity. It's seeking compression and tension where, it, and I'm, in my mind, seeking to reduce, reduce bending, which is an inefficient way of carrying load. Um, so it gave me a set of rules. So I would, I, would, I would say that it's a good direction to head in, but from my perspective now, in, 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 you know, it, it becomes a, a, a few different reasons. 
uh, because in those days we were aware that we should try to cut down on resource use. You know, resources were were non mostly non renewable unless we were lucky enough to get to use wood, um, and that we had to be very mindful of of their uh, running out um, and perhaps a, a penalty on nature. But we weren't. Uh, drawn, the, our attention wasn't being drawn to the emissions that were coming from making those materials. Now, there's, it's never been more important that we're efficient in our use of materials. And that will mean reusing existing buildings, even reusing existing space structures and finding ways of, of, of restoring them and, and making them work for us for, for more decades to come. But I'd, I'd, my main thing with my, my own students is and actually even in the institutions, is to, to make sure that engineers are always asking the question, why? I put it on one of the last slides. I don't know that I highlighted it that much, but um, it worries me that engineers think engineering is there for engineering's sake. Engineering is only there, and we should only be using resources if there is a very clear and very important purpose, uh, a benefit that it brings predominantly mankind but but nature too now we have to think of so i think become a become a specialist in structures that can be beautiful that can be uh, efficient and and really will give something back in in those qualities but always understand the deeper purpose purpose behind these don't don't think of it as an end in itself and uh, and that's something you may need to research yourself or be more aware of in, in practical work when you're, when you're doing practical projects. But if you can bring that into your research as well and think in terms of functionality and, and purpose and how you can benefit society and people through what, what you're doing, that, that for me is important. That makes sense, Mike. Yeah, some very pertinent arguments there. Thank you for sharing those. Um, and we've touched on this already in your presentation, but what do you think are the most pressing challenges in the field of spatial structures, um, particularly res with respect to some of those uh, current global challenges? Yeah, it, I could. I suppose I could go in a lot of different directions. If I don't, if I think I'll go in the direction that um, our facilities, our facility to do things, um, is growing and growing with with. Um, you know the digital transformation maybe ai for manufacture and and construction uh, i like to think with these tools also co-creation so we can bring the communities in who we're building for and so on um, all of this uh, this kind of should make what we're doing far better designed far better purposed um, and and you know, in the end be more more beneficial and less harmful um, but again, I, I fear that sometimes because we can, we do, and that we don't, we don't think hard enough about, about why we're doing things. So I suppose I'm coming back to the why again. Um, so I think we have to be careful that we don't fall in love with the tools. We have to fall in love with the purpose and, and the tools are serving that purpose. Um, I'd say, Another thing is, is that part of this again, it is, it is, and that is about reaching out to the people who we're serving. We're not serving engineers, we're not serving engineering, we're not serving science and mathematics, we are serving people. We are using, we're causing resources to be used, valuable resources. We're currently causing emissions, which are harmful emissions. We have to think very hard about why we're doing things and and tune our projects to do as most good and as little harm as as possible and i think that's a really big challenge for us the governments are changing city governance is changing there everyone is looking for decarbonized solutions and better um you know community uh, benefits from development so so that's important to sp uh, spatial structure designers as it is to any others and, and, this, and don't don't forget it, embrace that. Absolutely, Mike, thank you for that. Plenty of um, very interesting points for our spatial structures community to reflect on there. Thanks for sharing your answers. 
Um, we've now reached the end of our interview, um, but Mike, thank you very much for your time and for your presentation today. Just a quick reminder to our guests watching the series, uh, registration for the 2021 conference is now open. Please head to the conference website for full details and information. And if you've enjoyed this video or indeed any in the Movers and Shakers interview series, please remember to like, share and comment. All of your views and thoughts are very welcome. Mike, thanks once again for taking the time to join us today. It was a real pleasure to speak to you and hear about your engineering career. Um, and hopefully as we move closer to the uh, virtual conference in August, we can catch up with you again on the series. But um, for now, thank you very much. Pleasure, thank you very much, Mike. It's been, been, been fun. <laughs> See you soon, Mike. Bye-bye.